Caesar and Augustus by Mr. Amster. Before you begin, please make sure that you have a sharpened pencil or pen and a highlighter. On your left you have Julius Caesar and on your right you have Augustus. Julius Caesar. After Sulla left office, there was battles by leaders for power. Three leaders rose to the top. They became known as the First Triumvirate, and this is a three-person alliance, and it was Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar. All were military leaders, Crassus in Syria, Pompey in Spain, and Caesar, who became famous for his military exploits in Gaul, and please write in, Britain. Now Crassus was one of the richest men in Rome, which gave him substantial power in the Senate. However, their alliance breaks when Crassus is killed in battle. The Senate fears Caesar's popularity. Caesar's been a, a leader in Gaul, Britain, and he is building up popularity among the common man. Instead, the, the Senate chooses Pompey to come back and rule Rome alone. Now for this to happen, they need to do they need one other thing. They ask Caesar to give up his army and come home. What do you think that means? It means they want him to give up. Surrender his army, give up his power, and come back and basically live in house arrest. They fear him. They do not want him to become the leader of Rome. However, Caesar instead chooses something known as crossing the Rubicon. Does anybody know what that means? Well, first of all, the Rubicon is a river that protected the city of Rome. And basically what it means is once you do it, there's no turning back. Have you ever heard that before? Once you do that, there's no turning back? Well, crossing the Rubicon is where this gets its meaning. Eventually, Pompey will, defeat, will be defeated by Caesar. Where? In Greece, in about 48 BCE and he becomes dictator for at least one year. Please take a moment and highlight Crassus, Pompey, Caesar, Gaul, Spain, Syria, crossing the Rubicon. Please pause the video if you need to finish writing. Otherwise, let's keep going. In 44 BCE, Caesar is declared, declares himself dictator for life. Doesn't make him the most popular person in the crowd. But he doesn't just want power. He creates these reforms. And these reforms are actually very helpful. First of all, he allows for citizenship to all territories outside of the Italian peninsula, which means that there's more people that are trying to create loyalty with Rome. More loyalty, not a bad thing. He also allows for new colonies to be built to provide jobs and land. He wants to give the jobless jobs and the landless land and he wants to give these soldiers the land specifically. He wants less slaves 
and more workers. And he introduces what is known as the Julian calendar. This is a 12-month calendar with 365 days, one leap year, and is used exclusively, which means it is the only calendar used until the 1500, 1600s. That's pretty impressive, the 16th century, excuse me. And in fact, it is still used today by the Greek Orthodox Church. Now look at his reforms. Who are these reforms popular with? Who are they unpopular with? And why? Please take a moment and write these down. Make sure you circle the person who is, that they thought these reforms were popular with, and I want you to aggressively underline who they were not popular with. And of course, there should be an explanation as to why you think this. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. Now, the Senate feared, above all else, that he wanted to be king, and they plotted to kill him. And it's led by two people, Cassius and Brutus. I bet you learned about them when you read Julius Caesar. Maybe what you didn't know is that Caesar, that Caesar earlier on, pardoned both of them of previous crimes. Nice way to give back the, uh, the gift of freedom. Now, as you learned earlier in Rome, we learned about soothsayers. And there is a legend about the a soothsayer warning Caesar to beware of the Ides of March. Does anyone remember what date that is? Ides of March. Hmm. Now, if you said March 15th, you're half right. Half right? How can I be half right? Because there's also a second day that they would refer to, and that would be the 13th. So it was either March 13th or March 15th. Basically, it was a three-day window that Caesar had to worry about, supposedly from a soothsayer. And as the story goes, on March 15th, as he's walking into the theater, he is assassinated. And this causes another civil war to break out. And here is a picture of the assassination of Julius Caesar, which I'll make bigger in just a minute. But before I do, please make sure that you highlight 44 BC, dictator for life, Senate feared he wanted to be king. Assassination, March 15th, 44 BCE. Now, if you are not done highlighting or writing, please pause the video. Otherwise, I'm going to show you the nice picture here of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Although I don't know how nice an assassination picture can really be, but gives you the general idea. Does anybody remember this photo from the beginning of the year? Now, if you notice below, you have three lines. Please take a moment and identify two cause and effects that occurred during Caesar's life and leave room for at least one more. An example of a cause and effect is, it was sunny, so I put on a hat. Cause, effect. Think about the actions that caused Caesar to do what he did. 
You could think about the unrest that is caused and the creation of the triumvirate, the unrest after Crassus' death, maybe talking about crossing the Rubicon. Please take a moment and pause the video if you want to continue to write these in. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. Now let's talk about Octavian. Octavian inherits his wealth from Caesar. Now he is his great, his grandnephew, his grandnephew, excuse me, but also his adopted stepson. That's a little confusing, isn't it? And after Caesar's death, there's civil war. And eventually there's two sides. Octavian and all the followers of Caesar and the Senate. And it begins with the formation of the Second Triumvirate. This is includes Mark Antony and Lepidus, Caesar's two top generals. No, this is not the same Mark Antony that, is mar that was married to Jennifer Lopez. He's not that old. However, just as with the first triumvirate, we've got some issues. And these arise very quickly. After they get power, Octavian forces Lepidus. Make a note of that. To retire. And they split up Rome in half. Octavian gets the west, while Antony gets the east. And Antony allies himself with Cleopatra. What does she rule again? Uh, oh, do you remember? Hmm. That's right, it's Egypt. Make a note of that, please. So basically... Octavian's got the western part of the Roman Empire, and Antony has the east, but also makes a very big move taking control of Egypt. This is huge. Now, granted, it's not as powerful as it was, but that's still a lot of extra people adding to your forces. And eventually, after a few years of, of these battles, becomes the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. And this is where Octavian finally defeats them. He defeats them both on land and on sea. Armies and navies of Octavian defeat them. And this forces Antony and Cleopatra to flee to Egypt. Where eventually, as Octavian will close in, they commit suicide. Does anyone remember why they committed suicide? It's because they didn't want to be their statues, their, their, their trophies that they were able to bring back. Specifically Cleopatra. She was thought to be a very amazing woman. Both, you know, I mean, she's a ruler, but she was supposedly very beautiful. And she didn't want to be Octavian's trophy. So, instead she chooses that nobody can control her, and she chooses to, and, and to commit suicide. Very sad. So now it's 30 BC, and at the age of 32, Octavian stands alone. He has ended the Civil War, but in doing so, he has sort of ended the Republic. And this starts off a period known as the Roman Empire. I know, I'm very bad at making sounds. Anyway, let's take a moment, please, and please highlight... Inherits wealth, Second Triumvirate, Mark Antony and Lepidus, Battle of Actium, Start, Roman Empire. If you are still writing, please take a moment to pause the video. Otherwise, let's keep going. Changing my name. Because I can! Now, when he becomes ruler, Octavian will change his name to Augustus, meaning Majestic One. Now, one of the people that he has to convince is a guy by the name of Cicero. Cicero is one of the Rome's greatest 
public speakers. And he's famous for saying, any man can make mistakes, but only a fool persists in his error. And he supports Augustus, but wants him to restore the Republic. And think about that quote as you write it in. What does Augustus maybe not so much need to, what mistakes can he avoid? Now, Augustus respects Cicero. Who wouldn't? But Aug so Augustus gives some of the power back to the Senate. But really, he gave himself the power. He gave him a little bit, a taste, a sampling. But really gave, focused the power to give himself most of it. Now, here's where it gets interesting. He did not want to be known as a dictator, but chose the name Imperator. And that means, dot, 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 Commander-in-Chief. Make sure you write that down and make sure you underline it, and eventually you'll have to highlight it. Now, why does he choose that name? Think about it. Imperator, a Commander-in-Chief versus Dictator. Think about it. Now, think about Cicero and think about Caesar. What lesson has he learned? Please take a moment and write that down. Let's take a moment and highlight Augustus, majestic one, Cicero, Rome's, or public speaker, Imperator, Commander-in-Chief. If you need to finish writing, please pause the video. Otherwise, let's keep going. The Legacy of Augustus. Now, Augustus is thought by many to be the greatest ruler in Rome's history. And there's some very clear reasons why. First of all, under him, the population will grow to 50 million. That's a lot of people. Two, he gains control over all of Spain and Gaul, where beforehand they held pieces. They even will control into Britain and all the way to Hungary. So that's pretty much most of Europe. They, they have rule into Germania. They're expanding. They have a lot of control. And whenever you look at the greatness of an empire, one of the first things most people look at is how much was they able to control. He created a professional army of 150,000 men, and they had to be citizens. Now, if you remember, under Caesar, he increased citizenship and allowed people that were outside the peninsula to become part of it. But I want you to remember this, is that this professional army also will eventually help lead to its downfall. But that won't take place for another couple hundred years. He also takes in the Praetorian Guard which is about 9,000 people. And these guards are responsible for his protection and every emperor's protection. Although, when you learn about Nero, you're going to learn about how they sometimes don't always protect their emperor. And he created a new tax system. Now, if you recall from the Roman Republic video, or reading, there was corruption in the tax system. He got rid of that system. He created a system of government officials collecting taxes so they, wouldn't be ro so they would be robbing from themselves, basically. He also, did, he also helped create a nice legal system, although it still gave a little bit too much power in the common people's mind to the government.
and he issues in a time known as the Pax Romana, which lasts until 180 CE. Do you know what Pax Romana means? I bet some of you do. It literally means Roman peace. Please write that in right now. Yes, for about 140 years, or almost 200 years, the after, and even after the age of Augustus, it's a t Rome experiences a, a, a relative peace. And in many ways, it's its height. However, when he dies in 14 CE, there's no law of secession. They had never had really an emperor or a single ruler that hadn't that when had died appointed a successor. What are they to do? Well, Augustus, as you've already seen, is a smart guy. He chose a relative, a guy by the name of Tiberius. And the next four emperors are all in his line, and they're known simply as the Julio-Claudian family. And it starts with Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius and Nero. Yeah, I've warned you about Nero. He's a doozy. Now, although they follow in Augustus's bloodlines, they're not quite as fit to rule as him. Now, Tiberius and Claudius are decent. Don't give me that. But Caligula's got some mental issues that chooses him to act a little weirdly. And we don't talk about weird and, awk and awkward in, when we're in, in just a little like, oh, he's a little acting a little strange. He had some issues to deal with. Nero, well, I won't ruin it too much, but Nero's a pretty interesting ruler. In fact, he gets assassinated eventually by the Praetorian Guard. Please take a moment and highlight population, 50 million. Pax Romana, and the meaning. And that's it. The end.